Today, I'm speaking with Marta Tratsyuk, Ukrainian art ambassador, Gallery 101 founder, expert in international art projects and cultural diplomacy. She is also a leading expert on art consulting and curating and has been highly active in the effort to promote Ukrainian identity and art as part of the fight back against Russian aggression and cultural imperialism. Marta, I'm delighted to welcome you to the channel. <laughs> Thank you for having me here. It's a big, big pleasure for me. Well, let's start with a bit of background. So where where are you? Uh, you know, what, what have been your travels over the last year? And uh, also, what takes up most of your time? Um, now I'm in Lviv. That's the biggest Western city of Ukraine. Um, relatively safe, let's say like this. I uh, When the war started, I, I full-scale invasion, I was here. And I stayed here um, maybe first two months. Um, but after that, when I understood what can I do to help my country the best, I decided to do what I do the best. So uh, I decided to travel and do cultural diplomacy and make connections with the other my colleagues and so on. So last year I traveled, traveled pretty often. I was in some um, um, European countries. Then I went to Taiwan for one and a half month, also doing uh, like representation of Ukrainian art there, communicating with the uh, local representatives of art and culture. It was a great experience and I plan to continue to to make these connections between our two countries. Also, uh, I was curating an art uh, event in Zagreb, Croatia. Uh, after that, I flew to Canada for a short while and then Poland, so mostly Europe, but basically three continents, if you count um, Taiwan as Asian part. And then most of my, yeah, so it was pretty intense for me, but it was intense year for every Ukrainian. So <laughs> when you have this adrenaline in your blood and you understand that you have to do very quick what you can do in these circumstances, it kind of helps you, helps your brain and your body to be, you know, like uh, strong. And mostly now I, I'm, I'm in Ukraine, so I came back. I need some time for planning the next year and the intention of the next year and the, what my most of my plans related to making connections uh, between Ukraine and other countries in terms of art and culture and also doing this cultural diplomacy, telling about Ukrainian art, our uniqueness, Ukrainian culture, and also the project I started with my colleagues. The name is a Culture Against Aggression. Um, I can tell you more if you want about this initiative. Mm, we'll definitely come so to that. It, yeah. yeah, so it's related to uh, kind of um, a banning um, Russian imperialistic narratives in culture, and cutting their propaganda uh, channels. So that's basically my main ideas. It's international representation of Ukraine uh, in art and this, this cultural diplomacy and cultural sanctions on Russia. And it's never been more important. I mean, I, so many questions sort of emerge from, from, from what you've said there. But even this week, I mean, I know it's not art, but uh, you had something like the Miss World uh, competition and Russia was invited, and they came on stage uh, in 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 a creation, uh, sort of Russian hoot couture, which was, um, you know, had an imperial theme. Well, there's nothing more tone deaf and actually offensive that you could do at a time like this on the international stage as a Russian. And I know that's not art as such, but it does highlight the need to to counter. You know, imperial narratives and chauvinistic um, displays on the international stage. Yes, that's also a problem with Russia. They always have the same narratives and it doesn't matter are they in politics or in culture or in some social appearance everywhere the same. So, and we need to fight it and we need to explain to our colleagues and all people from abroad that why they should uh, be careful with the with information Russia gives them <laughs> um, because it's really 
well tailored narratives, imperialistic narratives they put in people's minds, and it 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 harms us as Ukrainians because um, uh, some people abroad, what I see, they feel pity for Russians sometimes when they the Russia attacking Ukraine, <laughs> they feel pity about Russians. So and I'm like, okay, I can argue about that with you. So yeah. I mean, you just have to translate that into, uh, you know, 1939, 1940, 41, and you know, not too many people feeling sympathy for Germany or Germans. And it's not a million miles difference, is it? Yes, but still, somehow people still don't understand that. Don't They don't understand the similarity. Maybe now when the time path passes and now they can see more, but first months of the war, it was really complicated to talk to foreign colleagues about um, imposing cultural sanctions on Russia because they had in their minds this Russian narratives about uh, good Russian culture representatives, culture that culture stands uh, far away from politics and war, which is not true, and they can check the history or anything, or just think critically, and they will for sure uh, know that it's not true. Same argument yeah, for sport, isn't it? You know, they say that about don't bring politics into sport. But anyone who understands how, well, not just Russia, but also China to an extent, um, in the Soviet period, and even more recently, uh, art, culture, literature, uh, all of these disciplines, and especially sport, are all extensions of power projection and not the kind of soft power projection that you get in the West. And you're talking about sort of hard power projection and hard influence. Yes, of course. And actually, so the problematic we have in Ukraine, and I can be honest with you, um, we didn't put uh, like necessary efforts uh, to tell about uniqueness of Ukrainian culture and separate uh, and like fight uh, Russian cultural narratives and separate our two nations. So we didn't do much. Our government didn't do. And that's the problem because now we have the results. Because Russia, they it appeared for me also, I was shocked on the maybe third months of the war doing this communication with foreign colleagues. I was shocked how Russia how how they managed to put deep roots uh, inside cultural institutions. So they they had um, uh, their representatives in boards of European art museums, for example, uh, making this um, exhibition exchange and many, many more. So they did a lot of cultural propaganda and we did almost nothing. And that's the problem. That's why we are struggling now to change people's mind to talk to them because we didn't talk to them, uh, to our colleagues for so many, for this all years of our independence. And it's really hard in one day to explain them why they should listen to us, not them. And, and I understand that now. So I try to be reasonable when talking with people and understand them also why they are not fully aware or of something related to Ukrainian culture, because we didn't do great job in the past. So that's, yeah, that's what we have now. now. It's catching up, yes. And, and I mean, it's not just about not being Russian, is it? There are much deeper differences. And, you know, I've been talking about this with many of my uh, Ukrainian uh, guests on the channel, talking about it in relation to history, politics, many aspects of culture. But I imagine also fits with art as well. And that is there's a fundamental difference, uh, it seems, um, that Russian culture predominantly is backward looking. It looks to the past for its sort of templates and its ideals. In a way, it also has this sense of a sort of lost utopia. So there's a sort of melancholy which imbues Russian art, literature and culture. How is Ukrainian art uh, different from that? Well, Ukrainians, we are looking ahead so we are trying to uh, to catch up with the older world we are trying to be modern contemporary um and maybe because we have 
um, as a country who are constantly fighting for so many, many years for our independence and, and show our uniqueness, uh, we have this uh, different approach of something new to be better, to, to show what we have, our culture. So we are eager to this kind of things. We, are, we don't looking backwards. We are looking forward ahead of us. And I think that's the biggest difference and also the difference of narratives we put in our art. Uh, it's usually um, more, um, so the, the narratives Russia has in, in the art, it's really imperialistic. The, this word is really often <laughs> I'm using, but that's that's true. In Ukraine, we don't have it. We just don't have this approach, the same as our brain, like our thoughts, they are different. The same you can see in art because art, especially contemporary art created now, it shows what what's in people's minds and that's it it's completely different i would say and of course the soviet period saw the repression of artistic styles entire schools of art uh, were oppressed and their works destroyed and of course many many artists were uh liquidated by the soviet state not just in the sort of 30s uh, but 40s, 50s, and even people were dying in the 60s and 70s in, uh, you know, poets, writers, and so on. So I think everyone kind of understands Soviet cultural repression, but they tend to still see it through a political lens, don't they? That this is like, uh, you know, this is a communist state repressing bourgeois culture. But there's another element to it, isn't it? Is that it's Russian chauvinism also repressing uh ukrainian identity at the same time yes, of course um so and that's why we have so many people uh from art and culture being rebellious of not abandoning ukrainian identity that's why they were killed or repressed and so on so that's another part of ukrainian identity and, and in art also constant willingness and um, need to be ourselves, not someone else's state, thoughts, culture. So that's kind of a rebellious part of us, but also it's part of our, um, maybe something different that we have. That's why we are still fighting for ourselves. That's why we didn't lose on first days of the war. And we will continue because that's in our hearts, brain, DNA, I don't know, as a nation. And people and... weren't listening, were they, prior to 2022? The war's been going on for eight years. Russian behavior has been going on for centuries. And to an extent, Ukraine is emerging from the shadow of history. Um, so you've been speaking to obviously hundreds of people in the sort of outreach process that you've been doing. Um and probably, you know, prior to this year as well. What are the big changes you've seen now that Russia has launched a full-scale invasion as opposed to its sort of hybrid war that we saw uh, in, in Donbass and Crimea? Mm -hmm. I see. So uh, after the Donbass and Crimea, it wasn't that big deal for all the society, especially in culture at that time. And actually, we even we as Ukrainians kind of adapted when years passed. We are adapted that we have part of the country which is in constant war. But still, but after full scale invasion, it was totally different because we are, were in danger to be eliminated, like um, eliminated or how do you call it, like destroyed and tot completely destroyed uh, by Russia. And that was a pretty um, intense time. And maybe I can tell more about this period. I remember, uh, so it was pretty shocking for me as for every Ukrainian. I remember when I woke up early in the morning of February 24th. And my husband told me that it started. <laughs> and I was like, oh, my God, um, what to do? So it, I, I had this uh, fight or flight response and, you know, like a complete shock. But on from the third day, probably of the war, I started to think, what can I do? Because you, you have a need to do something to do immediately. You can't just sit watching news. And... Um, then I was like, maybe I should cook, like a volunteer to cook or, you know, like do something else. Uh, but then my husband told me, maybe Marta, you should do what you're, you can do the best. 
in your niche. And, and it was the time I called to my uh, colleagues, galleries in my city, and I told, let's meet. Let's meet and discuss what can we do. Because I'm sure we have some work in our niche uh, to be done for our country. So on the fifth day of a full-scale invasion, we met in one of the gallery uh, in my city, Lviv, which became a shelter. So it was pretty unusual scene when you are inside the gallery and you see all this, uh, you know, like art on walls and people lying on floor. And it was... Wow, that was uh, a really stressful for me uh, experience. And then you even deeper realize the the toughness of the situation. And at that time, at that day, uh, we decided that we can fight on, on our cultural front. And <clears throat> we did the petition with the Ministry of Culture of Ukraine. And also we, I uh, registered a, a telegram group, Culture Against Aggression. Now it's uh, I, I believe it's uh, 1,600 um, different represent representatives of different cultural niches in Ukraine from theater, cinema, museums, galleries, and so on and so on. And we started to, um, we um, created a um, letter to our colleagues abroad. We translated it to many languages and we started to communicate with our colleagues, asking them to uh, put cultural sanctions in Russia and... Um, and then I realized that first months, actually, I was disappointed on the second months of the war. And it was first time I really cried <laughs> since the full scale war started because I understood that people, sorry, don't understand us. <laughs> and when we tell them, please cancel this concert with the Russian representatives, they were like, but but they are good Russian representatives, we can cancel. Or for example, I understood that even people, many people were trying to do special events, uh, round tables, artist residences for Ukrainian and Russian and Belarusian sometimes. And we are like, no, please don't do this. It's impossible. But they're like, why? And then I, that was the time for me that, that I understood that we need a lot of work to do in the future, maybe years even, to tell people why they shouldn't do this kind of things. Um, so, so the reaction uh, about the cultural society wor worldwide, uh, about our situation, our war, wasn't immediate actually. And now I see that people start to understand more, but First half of the year, we were fighting to be he heard, to, you know, to be accepted, our opinion to be accepted. And it was very tough with some museums, for example. So we had cases uh, when we canceled Russian representatives, like successful cases, and, and um, we made uh, some new connections with the um, different institutions instead, like they accepted us instead of Russian. Russians, but with some of them, we didn't succeed. So um, they refused us. So they decided to, especially though it related to institutions who, who've been working with Russia for many years. So they have financial benefits, some connections, you know, like it's kind of like in politics, maybe, maybe, and in different niches. So it's not only about a concert or something, it's about relations. And some of our colleagues, they just don't want to lose relations to the strong Russian culture, uh, you know, like, but now people start to understand more. So uh, now I, I can smile and say like, okay, we, uh, we, we see a success and we will continue and we have results. For example, I can tell you the recent result and that's really uh, it's related to uh Sergei Polunin he is a ballet dancer he's from he was born in Ukraine so he has Ukrainian citizenship but also Serbian and Russian and that's that famous guy uh who appeared on photos with um, Putin's uh, tattoo um yes 
And if to be honest, some years ago, I even I've seen a movie about him and it was pretty awesome movie. This guy is very talented, uh, like really, because not only in Bali, um, uh, society people knows him because of the movie many people knows him but he just so pro-russian that just recently and i found an evidence it's interview with him by russian channel and when when he told that they were organizing in russia concerts to collect money for russian army and and at the same time, I see this interview and at the same time in our group Culture Against Aggression, my colleagues shows me the, uh, the schedule of his next performance in Milan, <laughs> in Italy. And yes, we conducted the theater, um, our diplomats, and we convinced them to cancel this performance. But now it's um, now we have to think st strategically. What can we do with this kind of people who holds Ukrainian passport also, but do this kind of things? It's a betrayal. And then we start to discuss what will be more effective to um, deprive deprive Ukrainian citizenship from him, or to start um, criminal case and um, like I report him to Interpol, for example, to cut his uh, possibilities to make his propaganda. So that's the reality, for example, we are dealing now as Ukrainians, uh, cultural representatives, fighting then, for- know, People, I think, have uh, some kind of dissonance in their heads. They, 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 probably the Russian sort of propaganda of brotherly nations sits so deep down in people's subconsciouses they don't really think about it. But the equivalent would be, wouldn't it, that if you know someone in England was collecting money for the German army in 1942, would you tolerate them? And the answer is no, you absolutely would not. I uh, absolutely would not put up with, with that. And it's, it's exactly the same thing here. Obviously, Putin has been able to confuse things and cloud things because he had a lot of paid agents, a lot of paid assets, within the political establishment, within the security services and the military prior to the invasion, which is one of the reasons why he thought it would be successful. Um, did he bother to try and buy influence in the cultural sphere as well prior to the, uh, the invasion, or is that not really? Yes, yes. Actually, it was, as I see it now, it is one of this his, like, uh, major attention uh, attention uh, uh, attentions also so he um, so as i see it now yes he put a lot of efforts uh, but making this connections um establishing connections uh, in culture as i told before he, the um, for example hermitage they are the biggest probably art museum and very famous one um some time ago i've seen interview of the director of hermitage when he was publicly uh, publicly telling um that uh the culture is also a weapon so if the main guy in the main art institution telling like this you know what else you need as a proof they it was an intention because look who uh who kind of consume the culture mostly it's people with intelligence with the statues with the you know like uh those people many of these people they're in charge of decisions and you need to invest in their mindset through culture it's one of the easiest probably parts to do it especially if you tell that culture it's not political and so on. So it's really smart, but it was like this for years and not only with Russian uh, culture. Someone, somebody calls culture as the second diplomacy and I can agree with that now. After this month, what I see they did to cultural uh, institutions and representatives, influencers abroad, uh, trying to make them support them, even though they are, you know, like a terrorist state now. So yes, they invested. Well, absolutely. And that, that leads to what we've seen this year. And this is probably quite a difficult thing to talk about, but many museums of artists, 
many actual individual artists uh, have have died this year, uh, you know, under Russian occupation or um, I think one even uh, died of starvation um, uh, or you know, shortly after being sort of liberated from Russian occupation. And museums have been destroyed, cultural institutions, universities. Um, I mean, that must be incredibly painful to see it, but it also makes Russia's real intent, real character absolutely clear doesn't it it's it's a genocidal both in terms of population language but also a cultural genocide that they're intent on yes that's true for example uh, if i do any charity i always support if i manage to collect some money for charity i support um museum crisis center that's the institution uh, which was founded when the full-scale war started and they help smaller museums of ukraine because we are a huge country we have many museums we have national museums and uh, minister of culture take care of them but we have so many museums like in cities small museums and all those museums appeared to be abandoned because lack of hands, money, and everything when the war started. So this uh, charity foundation, they help these smaller museums to survive. Um, and uh, that's very important because sometimes, yes, the main battlefield is uh, with armor and so on, but also because they are trying to destroy our cultural identity and our heritage, which should be like for our future generation, they're intentionally trying as an imperialistic state to eliminate all, everything, our history and, you know, the future. Uh, so we need to protect it and we need to put many efforts to that. And it's really complicated process. And yes, most so we managed to evacuate um, many museums, the most important probably museums collections now in um, our museums, you don't, you will not see the most important collections. So they are hidden or evacuated. That's a secret information. Even I don't know that. Um, but we have temporary exhibitions going on, and and art and cultural life in my city is pretty intense, I should say, and uh, because people need it to normalize a little bit and to have energy, you know. And it's really big problem with the Russia destroying our uh, our heritage, but still, um, I believe in us, and I believe that we we can, you know, like survive and to protect what we have and we really do a lot of efforts with our colleagues um to help with that but that's a huge problem we have that that's true and so there's two things that come out of that i mean one is the idea that um no one wants a war but now it's happened and as you say the people in your town people across ukraine are right from day one of the full-scale war they're looking to how they can self-organize, what they can do, how they can contribute. So there's this incredible intensity that didn't exist in civilian life of people doing things, interacting um, uh, either to help or, or, or to create projects like yours. And that is also mirrored in the diaspora. I mean, when I speak to Ukrainians at every level of society, you know, they're incredibly active in either raising money to send back, support each other, or... If they have sort of journalistic or cultural skills, they're you know working twenty four seven to now all this cumulatively puts a focus on Ukraine identity and art, doesn't it? To an extent, you know, this is a difficult time, but what might emerge from this is a far sort of sharper, better defined, more vital and intense culture that emerges when this is all over. Yes, that's for sure, and. Um... And you, as you, as you mentioned about diaspora and people who moved to, like, they were forced to leave Ukraine, maybe because they don't have where to live anymore. Uh, they they do a lot, actually. And um, that's, uh, it's really hard to say like this. And it's good for our identity because it the, this war gives us the possibility to tell about us. And probably each or almost each of your uh guess an interview will tell you the same or told the same uh, but um we have problematics also with that for example i can tell you more about artists from ukraine who died 
or who can die, not only because they were under occupation, killed or something, because they went to the army voluntarily. Uh, for example, I went, to, um, so I, I flew to Taiwan with three other artists, girls, because I can't take men, uh, they can't leave the country for so long. So, um, so one of those artists, she has a husband and he, subscribed to the army voluntarily on the second day of the war so now he is not holding a brush but a gun and yes and that's many many cases like that so our artists are fighting now on the front line and that's really sad for me also part of the artists uh women but mostly they were forced to leave the country. So we have this, we, um, it's a dangerous situation when the, we have a, really a lot of bright people with the great personality and talent in art, for example, but they're serving the army or they were forced to leave the country. And it's uh, not easy to keep with the, your, you know, like art and so on when you're abroad. So for some people, it was some possibilities because connections, artist resonances, and so on. But, but it was maybe first month, but then time passes. And while when I'm speaking with them, I feel that they became more and more depressed because they are far from home and they want to come back, but, you know, it's complicated. So, yes, about diaspora and people who live now in outside of Ukraine, it's really... Um, hard topic because my husband actually he is also um um war reporter and youtube blogger um actually he switched his um channel to english language and start to do video about ukraine like war reporting but not only so he had uh he has many like stories about this kind of things and recently he was uh, um researching the topic that maybe ukrainians will be ukraine lesson like a ukrainians as a nation will be, will be on the second place of the most emigrated nation so that's that for example me it scares me out <laughs> it's really weird feeling because in on the one hand i understand that maybe we have some benefits from that but on the other hand it's really scary because our country, it just people left like massively the country. And yeah. And it must be enough. a worry about how many of them are actually going to return, you know, even when the hostilities um, are over. Many people are going to return and many already did. Mm -hmm. uh, I was speaking with like, at least from my circle and from the circles I related to, uh, because well, those people who already was abroad many times, they didn't have any illusion about immigration that it's easy and, you know, somewhere is better and so on. So when they understood that it's relatively more or less safe in Ukraine, they came back. They came back and they, you know, like do business here or they, they support the army, they stay here. Some people, they just can't come back. Financial reasons, no home anymore, you know, like, but... I believe many of them, if they will have possibilities to come back, they will. Uh, when the war is finished, maybe when fundings will be to rebuild buildings and everything, because I I, I hear about many people that for them, it's really uh, uncomfortable stay uh, and have this idea to stay forever in some other country. And it, it depends from the country, maybe. Maybe some people are more adaptive. Maybe some people are more patriotical i don't know what what is the reason but many people want to come back many many people what i know mm. that's that's a positive isn't it because i think um not that uh many ukrainians are gonna really be uh, you know losing any sleep over what happens in russia but i suspect many of the hundreds of thousands of people who have uh have uh, have left i call them draft dodgers rather than uh, refugees i think many of those won't go back uh, many of them will try to create a life um, uh, in other countries. Um, 
And uh, that that almost certainly will exacerbate the trend that we talked about earlier, is that Ukraine is forward looking. The fact that people return, the fact that they have a sense of ownership and responsibility for the future of their country um, means that its future cultural development is likely to be incredibly interesting and vibrant. Whereas Russians fleeing their country seem to have no sense of ownership or control at all. Or in many instances, no sense of responsibility for what's happening either. That doesn't bode well for any development of future culture. It will remain kind of backward looking and uh, extremely derivative. Yes, I, I I believe it will be a stagnation of their country. They, they already have because the so usually culture defines kind of people, society, and so on. It shows a lot about society generally, at, at least that part of the society who are um, intelligent, kind of, it may be bad to say like this, but anyway, um, if you see the situation with people, with, uh, with Russians as a nation, so you can project it on their culture. For me, it's really, you know, like, you can, you can, you can, I can see, for example, I see that uh, it will be a stagnation, and um, hopefully for me, as a nation, one day they will understand their responsibility. But I doubt it, but but for me, that would be the best case, case scenario if they understand their responsibility as a nation, but not that was Putin and Putin and we are, you know, like, we are just, you know, we are simple people. <laughs> no, it doesn't work like that. Mm -hmm at least in my perspective. So, yeah. And there's one more topic I want to talk about, because I think this is a really sort of interesting one. Um, and it's divisive in many countries, actually, you know, in many countries that are going through a sort of post-imperial or a phase or a re reassessment of their of their history. You know, I'm thinking in particular of, say, uh, you know, Britain decolonizing and, and, and parts of America coming to terms with the... Uh, you know, the treatment of the indigenous population there. And the topic, of course, is cultural appropriation. Um, and again, harking back to what we said at the start of the interview, people find it very difficult to, you know, understand how offensive it would be to, say, invite Ukrainian, Belarusian and a Russian in the same room. At the same time, they find it very hard to understand that there is such a thing as cultural appropriation by Russia. Uh, of Ukrainian Ukrainian art and identity, and that that has been going on for many, many centuries, in fact. So I don't know what your sort of views on that and how it gets tackled, because many Western collections of art will list artists who would have perhaps sort of uh, trained in Ukraine, been born in Ukraine, had a strong Ukrainian identity, and then perhaps moved to either you know where the money was let's say moscow and st petersburg in czarist times or even the soviet period where um you know um where again where the money and the influence and power was and all of these artists are tagged in foreign collections labeled in foreign collections as being russian and sometimes the subject matter itself is clearly ukrainian subject matter with cultural references ukrainian locations and they're still tagged as being russian and in russia so how do we how do we tackle this so it will take some time i believe and as professionals in that niche art historians have um, they have to deal with that that's their competition and international on international level i believe um the process is already started as i know but so it's institutional work so it will take maybe a couple of years to change it, but I believe it will be changed because as I know in some museums, uh, they already did that and they are working on that. Um, the same as in um, the biggest art auctions when some time ago we were together with Russia, <laughs> Ukrainian and Russian art, you know, like it was, but now not, but it will take some time because it's a huge work needs to be done, researches and uh, it's institutional work, let's say like this, and it's never quick. So I, I would give it a couple of years, but in the end, I believe our Ukra Ukrainian names of our cultural 
um, in, important cultural figures will be back to Ukraine as to be Ukrainian again in books, uh, re uh, registered in collections and so on and so in museums uh, on display. So I believe it will be it just it will need some time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, turning to your your speciality, which is uh, more sort of modern and contemporary art. My last question here is how vibrant is that? And are you getting much more attention now for Ukrainian art uh, in, in the sort of world market and amongst experts? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, definitely. We have more attention than we used to have, way more attention. But um, uh, and, and the uh, con Ukrainian contemporary art. Even before the full-scale war, it was really good level, um, up to date with other. Maybe it's not the best, but word, but trends, uh, trends of uh, contemporary art in the world. Because I travel a lot uh, and I discover art in many countries, in the most um, influenced art institutions and so on. So I have an eye, and I always an analyze what. What is the main topics related to art? Main techniques, main you know like in what's um, on the display in museums in many countries, different continents, and what do we have here in Ukraine? So I can tell that first we have really good schools, and the technique is really on on high level. But also about ideas that we put inside, it's really. Uh, with the, the same as all the art world, um, the same. So we are not, as as you mentioned before, Russians looking backward to their history. No, uh, we are up to date. So our art is really contemporary. And um, uh, even now when it's, there is a big attention to Ukrainian art and uh, it will be more and more, I can predict because for example, now some collectioneers, auction houses, some museums, they they had a chance to see how good is our art, how interesting and how different maybe something new because everyone like in, in this niche, um, top collectioneers or curator, curators and experts, they know what is like art in the United States, in Europe, in this country, in this country, because you have, uh, because of the culture, you have different aspects of the art and different, you know, like um, uh, approaches to art process, but they know nothing about Ukraine and now they discovered and it's interesting and it's, it, it will be more and more interesting for them because it's something different and undiscovered before. So we have this, uh, uh, opportunity now to show our art and um, actually we do our best with that what I see from um, uh, my colleagues also or institutions in Ukraine so they have uh, new connections with museums they have exhibitions they were invited to participate in some art shows art events biennials and so on and so on so it it has a um, we have a new good possibility to show and to start to be even on the art market if we tell about market um but the price we pay is just insane but yes we have um we have the good chances to be discovered we already discovered and to develop uh and identify ourselves on the art market um and we started already that and, and, you know, that sense of uh, forming nationhood, that sense of uh, strong determination of a relatively, not a young country, but a relatively sort of uh, young nation uh, and relatively new institutions, that also must, you know, inject energy into into art, culture and creativity as well. So it's it's not just confined to one area. There are many things, you know, evolving and improving at the same time. Yes, I I can predict that maybe we can be at uh, we we can be in the future trendsetters uh, of the art uh, niche actually, uh, because war changes a lot in people's mind, but also it sparkles creativity. Um, and after big wars, something new appeared in culture and art. So that that's already happening actually, and it will be a. Um, a big chapter of art history, I believe, yes.
that's for sure. So I, I'm very interested uh, and I'm very curious to see and to follow how it will evolve in the future and what we have now and what uh, what we had before. And I, I can see this evolution and it's really interesting and powerful. Actually, it gives me kind of when I feel down and, uh, you know, like um, a little bit not depressed, but lack of energy or motivation for some time, you have this bad mood. I try to remind myself that you are living in very important times and for, for Ukraine and generally for history and art history also. So you need to be energized and you need to do your best. That's the great motivation for me. Well, I love, I love interviews that end on a... Uh with a note of optimism, because uh, obviously so many of my conversations, especially when we turn to the future of your belligerent neighbor are, are certainly don't end uh, optimistically, but that's why I love sort of talking about uh, this kind of subject, because it is possible to see some kind of light at the end of the tunnel. And I wanted to thank you, Marta. It's been a huge pleasure speaking to you. I think our audience is going to find this absolutely fascinating. Um, and we'll also put some links maybe to the Telegram channel you mentioned, uh, to the organizations and the gallery you're associated with. We'll pop all those links into the description so people can follow up on those. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Slava Ukraini. Hello, I'm Slava.